So, I finished finals and back home, as you can see by the change in scenery um, behind me. Um, also, new added bonus to the channel. One of my lovely subscribers decided that they would help me with this channel by getting me a lapel mic. So I thought that this would be a perfect opportunity to take one of my lovely, well thought out, well constructed papers that no one else is going to see except for my professor and share it with you because I don't want to waste it. It's good work. I spent hours on it. Why not share it with my audience? It is relevant to this channel. Um, it has to do with prejudices and uncivil discourse. Well, prejudices and their influence on uncivil discourse. It was a social psychology class after all that I wrote it for, so it makes sense. You know, I didn't, I didn't have enough time between finals and packing to come back home for Christmas break to actually come up with a substantial 30 minute intellectual stimula intellectually stimulating video instead of doing something lazily half-assed you get you, you, you get basically part four of identity politics uh this was a series that i started i think over a year and a half ago oh. <laughs> it 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 contributes to that series but in a more specific way because it utilizes actual social psychology it it's very conclusive. It's very rounded out. I am very proud of how this essay turned out, so I thought why not share it with you. Anyway, I hope you enjoy. Prejudice and Uncivil Discourse In recent years, there have been many a time when uncivil discourse has been immortalized in the media for all to see. Hold on! These racist teachers have got to go! That's how whiteness works! Whiteness is the most violent fucking system to ever breathe! such as the recent events that took place in Charlottesville and Berkeley. Now this display of uncivil discourse gives the overall impression that those who are diametrically opposed to each other cannot possibly engage civilly. The Nazis shouted homophobic things like fuck you faggot. Many of them were carrying shields, guns, confederate flags, and Nazi flags. Then one of them drove his car into a crowd of counter-protesters, injuring 19 people and killing one. Heather Heyer was murdered by a Nazi during a Nazi rally as she fought against racism and white supremacy. But it doesn't stem from nowhere. There has to have been some form of origin story that has contributed to the current toxic state of discourse in the West. My belief is that uncivil discourse stems from the prejudices a person holds about their opponent. A prejudice is, of course, some preconceived notion, not based in fact or genuine experience. Examples of this behavior would be, say, a member of the LGBT community who perceives that any person who voted for Donald Trump in the 2016 presidential election did so on grounds of hateful bigotry against marginalized groups. Another example of this would be someone whose perception of black Americans is that they are all thugs. Both of these mentalities are prejudices, and they are prejudices that might contribute to the turbulent nature of uncivil discourse. Such a thing has the tendency, in extreme cases, to become violent to the point where police intervention is deemed necessary. In my day-to-day -day life, I observe uncivil discourse to a lesser degree than the all-out riots of Charlottesville and Berkeley, thank God. But in people who range in opinion from the most staunch conservative to the most progressive of liberals. Now, each interaction that I encounter varies as much in topic of discussion as in position of the parties engaged, and as in the quality of the discussion being had. These interactions are by no means the most productive, rather they are usually emotionally charged, ideologically driven, verbosely insensitive to the other party, and utterly lacking in the courtesies found in civil discourse. Now, because this piece is discussing prejudice and uncivil discourse, which are both social in nature, it would make sense to analyze it using several concepts from social psychology that contribute to our understanding of its initiation and its perpetuation. So, schemas will be discussed, self-fulfilling prophecy will be discussed, overconfidence barrier will be discussed, cognitive dissonance will be discussed, and aggression will be discussed, obviously. These five concepts all tend to play on each other to concoct the perfect formula of combustible discourse. 
Let's get started. The first of these concepts I'd like to address is a schema, which is a pattern of organized thought or knowledge about the world. In layman terms, it is essentially a file in the filing cabinet that is your brain. In order to fill that filing cabinet, there needs to be an intake of information in some way. This can be done in your everyday experiences, through the media you consume, the people you interact with, etc. Now this is how you gather information, and it plays a substantial role in opinion formation. Depending on how all-encompassing or even accurate the information you're receiving is, there is the potential to incur massive bias about any one thing. Going back to that in those um, hypothetical scenarios that I presented at the beginning of this piece, the LGBT voter, the Trump, the, um, the LGBT member, the Trump voter, and the Black American. Now, if all the information the LGBT member has about all Trump supporters is from heavily left-leaning publication, that person's perceptions of said Trump supporters would not necessarily be charitable. Likewise, the reverse can be true for the prejudiced person with regards to Black Americans. If the entirety of your schema with regards to these people, Black Americans and Trump supporters, is filled with incorrect information, it forms the basis for prejudice about that group of people as a whole. Anyone you meet who belongs to these respective groups are either thugs or hateful bigots, and there's no gray area. Note, this is before they've probably even interacted with said people. The establishment of a prejudice about a group of people is important to uncivil discourse because it can influence the way that you might treat a person within that group in an everyday setting, which brings us to the action portion of uncivil discourse. The more prominent and rigid the schema a person holds, for instance, that any Trump supporter and all black Americans are undesirable, the more likely such a bias is to be confirmed. This is due to the self-fulfilling prophecy, the nature of which is such that the schema one holds with regards to a person influences how one acts towards that person, which causes said person to act in accordance with the biases already held. Thus, it stands to reason that if you were to call the Trump supporter a hateful bigot, they would react none too kindly. Likewise, it is the same for the black American being called a thug. Both of these claims being made are about the individual's character and are by their very nature defamatory to the individual's reputation. In today's society, an accusation of thuggery or hateful bigotry can cost a person their job, their relationships, their family and friends, and their reputation within society. The very act of defaming a person's character with an ad hominem due to the fact that it is an action done with the intent to harm an individual, can be considered an act of aggression in this instance. Hence, aggression can, unsurprisingly, stem from the need to retaliate after being on the receiving end of aggressive behavior. In a study done by Cohen, Nisbet, Bowdy, and Schwartz, it was found that Southern participants who were bumped into and subsequently called an asshole, were more primed than those Southerners who were not insulted, and Northerners who were for aggression, both physiologically and cognitively. The Southerners in the study deemed being called an asshole as being an attack on their reputation, and thus felt motivated to restore and protect their reputation in some way, whether by a display of dominance or in acts of aggression. Now, to connect this study with the hypothetical that I have posed, there can be a connection drawn in both instances, because someone is being insulted with an inaccurate ad hominem, perhaps. However, in the Southern study, the ad hominem is less meaningful, as asshole isn't as personal an attack on the individual character as thug or hateful bigot due to the more personal attack nature of the insults within the hypothetical that I have posed, it can be assumed that the reaction of the individual being called the ad hominem would be greater. Being called a hateful bigot or a thug can set the person off in one of two ways. Either the person will resort to shouting ad hominem in turn, or the person will proceed to adamantly deny these claims and rush to provide evidence to the contrary. Which brings us to our next social psychology term. In the case of the Trump supporter, maybe they're a member of the LGBT community, or perhaps the Black American is a physician. In either case, there is now cognitive dissonance in the person making the claim that the Trump supporter is a hateful bigot and the Black American is a thug, due to the nature of the extra information they've just received. Cognitive dissonance is discomfort caused by conflicting attitudes, beliefs, 
and behaviors. Now, um, typically a person seeks to reconcile this discomfort because no one likes a little bit of discomfort in their heads. The, the person making these claims, they cannot reconcile that all Trump supporters are hateful bigots against marginalized groups if this one, if this particular one Trump supporter is an LGBT member. Nor can they continue to make the claim that all black Americans are thugs if this one is actually a physician. According to Festinger's theory of cognitive dissonance, when there is cognitive dissonance, there is a need to reduce the tension created by the dissonance, and there are three ways to do this. The first method of reduction is to change the cognition. This is where the person making the claim reevaluates one schema so that Trump supporters and hateful bigots, or thugs and black Americans, are no longer synonymous concepts, you know? This is the less inflammatory of the three methods in this instance, however, due to the tendency of people to possess an overconfidence in the accuracy of their own perceptions, or an overconfidence barrier, the dissonance created is unlikely to resolve itself so easily. The second way is for there to be a change in behavior. Now, due to the nature of this hypothetical, a change in behavior would not be acceptable. The third method to reduce cognitive dissonance is to add a cognition. Now this is where the person making the claim might rationalize in some way that allows for the two contrasting claims to coexist without disharmony. They might approach with a different method of assassinating that person's character by claiming that the black American physician only managed to get his degree to two affirmative action policies, and thus doesn't deserve his practice. Or perhaps the LGBT Trump supporter only voted the way that he did because they're a greedy capitalist who hates the welfare class. Invariably, the cycle of aggression and dissonance continues, escalating the uncivil discourse further and further until either both parties are made to separate by some other third party or violence has erupted and one emerges victorious, while the other fades into relative silence. That may sound rather morbid and a tad extreme, however, as has been observed in the current state of discourse within Western countries, it has become an increasing occurrence. This has been observed from events as insignificant as the interaction between Zarna Joshi and Rudy Pentoya, where a simple joke was blown massively out of proportion to the devastating outcome of the rallies in Charlottesville. Perhaps, in better understanding, how uncivil discourse is initiated and then perpetuated, we can work to reduce it in everyday interactions. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to come out with a few other videos this week. Two, actually. I have two planned. It's going to be fan friggin tastic But I didn't want to just come out with something half-assed, so I came out with an essay that I worked for hours on. I hope you guys enjoy it. Really, I do. If you like what I do on this channel, please consider checking out my Patreon and maker support links, Teespring link, maybe the Amazon store link, I don't know, whatever it is that you want to do or feel like you want to do to support, totally go ahead. If you like me, but not necessarily that much, that's cool. You can also like, comment, subscribe, uh, share, because that always helps. Uh, until next time, adios.